Pen Pal by Jathan Auerbach is a creepypasta turned novel released in 2012. It's split into six sections, that being footsteps, balloons, boxes, maps, screens, and friends. I heard about it from an episode of Creepcast. I'm scared. <laughs> I'm about to cry. It's very kind of me to shout out a small channel, I know. Before we begin, I would highly recommend you buy the book or listen to the Creepcast video on it. But if you don't have the time or money, then let's just... This chapter introduces us to our main character who is nameless as the book is in the point of view of him reminiscing about old memories. This memory being from his childhood when he was six years old living in a half house with his mother. I know this ain't an image of a half house, but it's what I imagine while reading it, so I'ma stick with it. He would often feel as though he could hear footsteps in the night and would sometimes wake up on the bottom bunk of his bed when he remembers sleeping on the top bunk, but he would just think it's sleepwalking and would brush it off. He would enjoy adventuring in the woods outside his house, but would have to be back before dark, and he would often imagine things chasing behind him so he would run faster towards his house. I mean, when I read this, it was so, it opened a little hole deep in my mind and I'm like, oh fuck, I used to do that as a kid. Anyway, one night he randomly wakes up in the middle of the woods, even though he fell asleep on his top bunk. He's surrounded by thorns and he's next to a shark pool float. After walking for what feels like hours, his feet bloodied up from the thorns, he ends up right where he started next to the shark pool float, and then he decides to follow a star and slowly starts to recognise his street. He then sees the lights on his house are on, and when he tries to knock on the door, he is grabbed and pulled backwards. A large man exits the house, but it's just a cop and the person who grabbed him is his mother because she didn't want him to run away again. He's confused until she shows him a note saying he never wants to see her or his friends ever again. He looks at the note and he thinks, this isn't how you spell my name, I didn't write this letter. And that was Footsteps, originally supposed to be a short story for r slash no sleep, but when the comments asked him to write more, he wrote. Such a smooth ash transition there, I know. Anyway, this chapter takes place a year before Footsteps and follows our protagonist participating in a pen pal program in his kindergarten class. A lot of fucking peas there. Everyone in his class has to write a letter saying a bit about themselves and asking whomever gets the letter to send a letter or picture back to the school and he is the only one to come up with the genius idea to add a dollar with four stamps written on it. Weeks go by without him getting anything but one day when he gets into class, his teacher pulls him aside and tells him to try and not be disappointed by what he got and she hands him a picture so blurry he can't even tell what it is and he gets more and more of these throughout the school year. At the end of the year, his best friend Josh leaves with the second highest number of pictures, that being four, and our main protagonist leaves with nearly 50. Later in the year, our main protagonist and his best friend Josh decide to make a snow cone business in the neighbourhood and their business is going well until our main prote- I'ma just call him David, okay? I'm already getting tired of saying our main protagonist. Anyway, David cuts his finger on his toy snow cone machine and coincidentally, a man gets a cherry flavoured snow cone and looks at his snow cone and then he looks back at David's bloody finger and says, you boys sure have put a lot of yourselves into your business and then he hands them a dollar. The book then introduces us to David's neighbour, Mrs. Maggie, and this is the book's introduction to her. And instead of saying when there's something that's not in the creepypasta and just in the book, I'ma just put a red dot on the screen to save some time. When David and Josh are going through their pockets, they find a dollar bill marked four stamps. And they think it's so cool how loads of people have exchanged this dollar to the point that it's right back in David's hands. Later in the day, David tries showing Josh the pictures he got from his pen pal but Josh isn't interested, so instead, they go play in a ditch in the woods and they hear machine-like sounds coming right next to them. Josh thinks it's a robot and David thinks it's a mummy, but they mainly think nothing of it. I forgot to fucking breathe during that section. Later that night, David goes through the pictures and notices something. He's in every one of them. The next day, he tries showing his mum while she's going through the mail. He's worried she'll be mad at him, and after he shows her, she goes quiet and calls the police. He panics and tries to tell her it's not his teacher's fault, but he notices an envelope that his mother dropped containing a picture of him and Josh in the ditch, and she tells him she's calling the police because that letter had no stamp. For the average Mr. Crocs and Socks viewer who doesn't understand, that means it's hand delivered. This chapter starts by telling us how David broke his arm a couple weeks before kindergarten by falling out a tree, so his mom gets him a kitten he calls Boxes. 
boxes would often run under the crawl space underneath the house, so his mum would use the sound of the can opener to lure him out. After the events of Footsteps, David and his mum are moving to a new house in a week, and boxes gets under the crawl space, but the can opener is already packed, so David's mum has to crawl into the crawl space to get him, and when she gets out, she tells David they're going to move into their new house right now. He says he needs to call Josh to tell him, but his mum says he can call him when they get to the new house, and when he asks about the clothes not packed, she says she can buy new ones, and they leave to go to the new house. As the years pass, Josh and David's friendship stays strong, if not stronger, with them staying at each other's house nearly every weekend, and one night, when David is staying at Josh's house, his mum calls him to tell him that Boxes has ran away. After a lot of thinking, David tells Josh that Boxes probably ran back to the old house, and that they should go back there right now, because David's mum told him he's not allowed to go back to the old house. That's little Smith's reference in there for you Smith heads, you Smithy Smithersons. Smith. You Smithy Smithy Smooth Smooth Smoogers Smithers. That Smoogers sounds like a slur. Smithy Smithy Smith Smithers Smith. There's a section that briefly mentions Josh's sister Veronica, but more importantly is when Josh and David are walking through the woods, they see it, the shark pool float, and Josh lays in it, and honestly just fucking around like a normal 10 year old, till he finds a small pit and starts screaming. Josh fell in a pit of tiny spiders, and after getting them off, they make their way back to David's old house. The David and Josh do, not the spiders. But instead of people living there, like David's mum said, it's completely worn down and abandoned. They do rock, paper, scissors for who has to look in the crawl space, and David loses and starts looking in the crawl space, while Josh waits outside, but David is overwhelmed by a horrible smell. There's a dead raccoon, but no sign of boxes, but Josh comes on the walkie-talkie and tells David he's going to go inside the house, and he's put a wooden panel by the crawl space just in case boxes runs out. David then finds multiple bowls with cat food in it and thinks how cool it is that his mum set this up for boxes. Josh then comes on the walkie-talkie and tells David his clothes aren't in boxes like he said they were, and instead they're hanging up in the closet. He then says, Your walls, man. Your walls are covered in polaris yourself. There are hundreds of them. What are you, hire some- After a moment of silence, David can hear footsteps in the house, and then Josh comes back on the walkie. There's someone in the house. It sounds like he's on the verge of tears. He's He's got something, man. It's a big bag. He just threw it on the floor and... Oh my god. Man, the bag. I think it just moved. David then shines the flashlight around the crawl space and sees dozens of dead animals, some fused together by the passage of time. Then David hears Josh scream, and I quote, It was matched by another scream that wasn't full of fear. And I'm so sorry to break the tension, but when I read this, I just imagined the fucking random encounters baldy dude. To get back to speed, let's do a little scary break. Anyway, someone starts taking the piece of wood off the crawl space, but it's just Josh. And as they run away, they drop the walkie-talkie and Josh yells, My picture! He took my picture! When they get back to Josh's house, David puts his muddy shirt in Josh's bin outside for him to get in the morning, and just goes to sleep in one of Josh's shirts. But the shirt isn't in the bin in the morning. Later that day, David hears meowing coming from under his bed, and excitedly rips the blankets from underneath his bed, only to see his walkie-talkie. Boxes never came home. The first half of this chapter focuses on David's neighbour, Mrs. Maggie, but the author adds this part about her husband, Tom, who wants to go on a trip to Rome with her before her dementia gets worse. Every night, Tom goes on a run, so he's in better shape to go hiking in Rome. He goes out at night when Mrs. Maggie is asleep, so she doesn't find out about the Rome trip, and it can be a surprise. One night, David's mum finds out that Tom died on her yard when getting back from a run. Mrs. Maggie never found out about the Rome trip, and her dementia got worse with her roaming the streets at night looking for Tom. The author just adds this heartbreaking story for a character that had so little backstory in the creepypasta and it is genuinely just so devastating. Anyway, Mrs. Maggie would often mistake David and Josh for her own children and would sometimes call them by the wrong name and say she can't wait for Tom to come home. David and Josh would often play by the lake outside Mrs. Maggie's house 
and she would watch and be friendly and even invite them inside, but Josh and David never accepted, especially because David's mum told him not to. She would be nice enough to them, even giving them a shark pool float to play with in the water. Later in the year, Josh and David made a map to explore the woods, and even made a makeshift raft to explore the woods faster, but David isn't allowed out past sunset. One night, David's mum gets called into work and our colleague comes to pick her up and it says, I would propose to her a couple years later when my mother brought me to work with her to pick up her paychecks. Samantha would tell me that I was sweet, but maybe we should wait till I was a bit older. Now, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but I thought it meant like marriage proposal and I found it strange because he's a kid and she's probably in her 20s or something. But maybe I'm reading this wrong and someone smarter than me can explain it in the comments. Anyway, David's mum says to stay inside and be safe and that the phone isn't working so she can't reach them. So after she leaves, David and Josh go out to expand the map. They take the raft and bring some Roman candles because they can't find a flashlight. They also wear their bathing suits underneath their clothes so that when they get on the raft, they can leave their clothes by the shore. The woods is completely silent in the dead of night until they hear the sounds of leaves crumbling from the right of them. Then it starts to get louder and louder. So David calls out. Hello? <laughs> hello? Josh and David start making hello jokes until Josh takes it too far by making fun of how British people say hello by saying hello there mate. Moving Dathan Auerbach down to an F tier next to that out. old bastard Aaron Beauregard. But anyway, Josh and David are just going down the river until they hear something in the distance. Oh. It came from across the shore in the pitch black. David's curiosity overwhelms him, so he grabs a Roman candle and shoots it towards the darkness, but there's nothing there. They quickly paddle back to David's house, but they hear footsteps running in the same direction as them. As they paddle, the raft collapses and they have to swim back to shore, but the footsteps get louder towards them, but it's just a deer and they run back to where they left their clothes. When they get to them, David looks at Josh and says, Where's my shirt? Josh says it probably got knocked into the water and he makes his way back to the house and David keeps looking when Miss Maggie comes over and starts talking to him. David makes a joke about coming into Mrs. Maggie's house to dry off but she says not tonight as mom's home. M mom. It's mom in England in the in the great nation. Come on England. <laughs> back to the <laughs> back to the fucking story. David panics when she says this and runs back to his house only to see that his mom is not back yet. He then finds the map in his pocket, even though it fell in the water, but it has two stick figures drawn in it, one bigger than the other, with them holding hands. It has his initials written next to it, with 15 or 16 written by the side. When looking back on the memory, David remembers a few weeks later, when he saw people in biohazard suits bring out multiple black bags out of Mrs. Maggie's house. He also remembers how he didn't understand why Mrs. Maggie said his mom was home when she wasn't, but looking back on the memory, he realised she didn't say mom's home, she said Tom's home. In the beginning of the first grade, David gets pink eye and Josh and him are given different lunch schedules. David sits alone at lunch and because he sits alone at lunch, no kid in his class wants to be friends with him, except one kid older than him called Alex. Alex only befriends him because he has a crush on Josh's sister Veronica and he knows that David and Josh are best friends. Most people have a crush on Veronica, they're people their age obviously, with two boys even getting in a fight over her, and even David thinks she's pretty. Alex asks David to ask Josh to tell his sister about him, so later in the week, he tells Josh, and he's pissed off that so many people like his sister, and calls her an ugly crow. We then get introduced to David when he's 14 years old, originally 15 in the creepypasta. He has new friends now and Josh goes to another school. But one night, when he goes to a rundown movie theatre, he runs into Josh's sister and asks her to go to next week's showing of Dawn of the Dead. And she says yes. When David asks his mum to take him, she's fine with it until he mentions he's going with Veronica, to which she gets serious and tells him he can't go. He tries to call Veronica to tell her this, but he thinks Josh might pick up and they haven't spoken in three years. After several rings, a woman picks up and tells David that he's got the wrong number. He feels guilty and plans to talk to Josh after his date with Veronica and comes up with a plan to go to a friend's house and just walk to the theatre instead of being dropped off. When he gets to his friend Chris's house, he tells him the plan and Chris volunteers to stay behind as he's talking to a girl online, basically e-dating before e-dating was cool. And by cool, I mean cringe. <laughs>
Chris says David will make a fool of himself, to which David tells him to try and not to electrocute himself when he tries to have sex with his computer. For this chapter, I think it worked better in the creepypasta with David being 14, because it seems weird a 17 year old girl would go on a date with a 14 year old guy. I mean this entire chapter is unrealistic, because 15 year old dudes aren't going out with girls. They make YouTube videos about evil playgrounds. Anyway, on his way to the theatre, a car with a broken window stops next to him for a second, then drives away. David thinks it's probably a theatre employee and continues walking. He meets Veronica at the theatre and after the movie, they walk around a nearby abandoned mall and David tells her a made up story about a monster. It was a weird little inclusion that I felt was just to add page numbers, but I did find it quite fun. On the way to Veronica's car, David notices the car with the broken window next to hers and thinks it's strange that an employee would still be here, but he forgets about it and asks Veronica about Josh and Alex but she gets weird about it, so he tells her how shit his phone is and that it can't even receive images. And then he leaves to go behind the theatre to piss. He just, he, he pisses behind the, he goes behind the theatre to take a piss. He jumps over a chain link fence so Veronica doesn't see, but after a minute, he hears the sound of an engine and a scream. He runs to Veronica, but trips and hits his head on a bench. He gets up after about 30 seconds. He jumps the fence and runs over to Veronica only to see that her body is completely mangled to the point that he can't tell if she's laying on her back or her front and he can even see some of her bones. David's phone has no signal so he has to use Veronica's to call the ambulance but as he grabs her phone she lets out a gasp for air so violent it causes David to jump back in fear and when she regains a bit of consciousness she can only let out a single sentence. He, he, a picture, my, my, picture he took it when in the hospital veronica's phone starts ringing in david's pocket and when he sees it's her dad chris is more out of guilt and because his phone is dead he has to call his mum on the hospital phone and they sit in the waiting room for a few hours barely talking david puts veronica's phone in her purse out of shame and later when veronica's parents come to the hospital she's taken out of surgery with a cast on 90 percent of her body david visits veronica for the next week even when another patient is moved into her room with bandages covering their face. When David visits Veronica on the seventh day, she tells him that Josh ran away two years ago after his 13th birthday and he left a note on his pillow and later in the day, Veronica texts him telling him not to come back to the hospital. In that week, David and Veronica keep in contact over text and David calls Veronica but only hears breathing on the other end and a few days later, Veronica texts him, I love you. Over the next several weeks, they text more and more, Veronica even saying how she wants to be with David and can't wait to see him, but when David would ask when, she would always say, soon. The next week, they plan to meet up at the theatre again to watch a movie, but when he gets there, she doesn't show up, and a man sits next to David. David tells him the seat is taken, but he doesn't listen, so David leaves. The next day, David asks her why she didn't show up but gets no response until he gets one last message from Veronica. See you soon. David asks his mum for their new house phone number and he tells her how Veronica stood him up the night before. David's mum looks at him confused before breaking down and telling him that Veronica died weeks ago on the last day he visited. David asks why they didn't shut her phone off and David's mum tells him that Veronica's parents got a call from their phone service provider informing them of the charge for hundreds of pictures sent on the night after Veronica died. Pictures all sent to David's phone that he hadn't received. He then thinks about the last message she sent. See you soon. This chapter starts on David's first day of kindergarten, when he accidentally breaks his cast in the shower, making him late for school. All his classmates have already started their activities, and David is so stressed that he doesn't listen to the teacher and messes up the activities so badly that his classmates tell the teacher they don't want to be in a group with him. It is genuinely really sad to read. Like it says he spent all day before getting ready for school and even picked out a sweet ass Ninja Turtles lunchbox and he even brought a pen so people would sign his cast. And at lunch, David sits by himself and some kid tells him he likes his lunchbox. David thinks he's making fun of him and he's about to cry until he notices the kid has the same lunchbox as him and the kid introduces himself as Josh and signs his cast. On his 12th birthday, David holds a party and invites Josh, as they haven't spoken in 7 months. The party's going well when David asks Josh why things got so awkward, and he simply says, you left. And before they can say anything else, 
David is called in for presents. Things are fairly normal until David gets a card saying I love you. David thinks one of his friends is pranking him. He plays it off as a joke until he gets a pair of walkie talkies from his mother. When Josh sees this, he goes into the kitchen to call his dad. He says he'll try and see David more often, but before he leaves, he says, I think I've been sleepwalking. Now for this section, there aren't going to be a lot of badly photoshopped images, so you just got to use your imagination. Anyway, years later, when David talks to his mother about what happened, she tells him when Josh ran away, his parents did everything they could to find him. They spoke to local parents, they posted on missing children's forms, and they did everything they possibly could. One day, Josh's parents get a call saying someone has seen him in Florida, and when they ask where, the caller yells, in Disneyland, and he laughs before hanging up. They would get calls like this a lot, but could never change their number in case Josh called them, so they had one of their friends answer their phone for them. When Josh went missing, something inside his mother broke, and when Veronica died, she stopped going to work, and she would go out at night yelling for Josh and Veronica to come home. His dad couldn't take work that was too far, so he had to do odd jobs for money. One day, David's mom gets a call from Josh's dad, telling her to come to the woods, and when she gets there, he's got his back turned to a hole, and is repeating to himself, I don't understand. When David's mum looks in the hole, she sees Josh's body, but it's not just Josh. A man is laying on top of him, holding him, and pinned to Josh's shirt is a picture of David. Josh's dad then says, I can't tell my wife. I can't tell her that our, that our little boy, she couldn't bear it. Josh's dad tries to pull the man out of the grave, but the man's collar rips and he falls back onto Josh causing Josh's lungs to release the remaining air from his body. This angers Josh's dad to the point that he grabs the man by the shoulders, pulls him out of the grave, and yells at him. You motherfucker! Josh's dad looks at Josh and breaks down crying. As David's mum looks at the corpse of the man and finally sees the man who's been stalking her child for years, and I quote, The corners of his lips were turned up only slightly. She saw that he was smiling. This wasn't the expected smile of a maniac from a film or horror story. It wasn't the smile of a demon, the smile of a fiend. This was a smile of contentment or satisfaction. It was a smile of bliss. It was a smile of love. She then realizes that Josh bit the man's neck in an attempt to escape, but this only killed the man and trapped Josh under him until he died. Josh's dad then carries his son's body out of the grave and mentions how Josh's hair was dyed and David's mum notices that Josh is dressed in David's old clothes and he has a map in his pocket. Josh's dad tells her to leave and yells that he did this and that a month ago, the same man asked him to fill this hole for a hundred dollars. David's mum asks what to do with Josh's body, to which his dad says his final resting place won't be here with this monster. Josh's dad burns the man's body as David's mum leaves and she hopes that Josh's parents will be okay. When David is told this, it's already been 10 years and there's nothing he can do about it. If David's mum told him or even Josh's parents, maybe things could have been different. David thinks about how much he loved Josh and how nice his parents were and the love he felt for Veronica. And the author adds this fucking line. I tried to pretend that I don't know what the man might have done with Josh for all that time. Just like I tried to pretend that maybe Josh wasn't in the passenger seat the night Veronica was hit. Dude, that wasn't even in the original Creepypasta, just the book. It's just more salt in the fucking wound, man. And finally, the last lines are, I miss you, Josh. I'm sorry that you chose me, but I'll always cherish memories of you. We were explorers. We were adventurers. We were friends. And that was Pen Pal. I'm going to go cry now for 20 minutes because my God, was that so heartbreaking. I know it's like the opposite of the books I usually talk about because there wasn't loads of death or gore, but the impact was so much more than anything I've covered so far. It was more about the outcome of violence than the violence itself. Like, Wedding Day Massacre was just tons of people getting killed, and some of it was sad, but it didn't really focus on what happened after they died, unlike Pen Pal. And the fact that this guy stalked him for years, and there was no big confrontation or justice for Josh, like, oh my god, it was just so damn impactful. And I don't know if he was a paedophile or just watching David and it wasn't like romantic kind of love, but like a friendship kind of love. I have no idea. Tell me what you think in the comments. 
Nice little plug to the comments there. Also, shout out to the guy playing the stalker. Everyone give it up for Mr. Crocs and Socks' friend. He did a great job, and thank you to my wonderful editor, Mr. Crocs and Socks' editor. Seven bucks? Are you fucking serious? Also, if you couldn't tell, I'm mainly going to focus on horror book reviews, despite what I said in the playground video. And on that note, I'm not going to be a disturbing book guy. Also, I just want to say, a few videos ago, I referred to Jellybean as she, her, when they go by they, them. I'm a book reviewer second, and a pronoun respecter first. And I saw some people on Twitter, you know the place where they called MatPat the freaking N-word, were going after the other person who did a playground video, and they were just going at her like a pack of hungry dogs. My goodness. So, to the three of you still watching, like, just go watch her slob video, because I'm never going to review that book ever, like fucking ever, stop fucking recommending it, I'm not gonna fucking read it, so if you wanna see what happens in that, just watch her video. And some people said the music was too loud in the last video, and to that I say, While I'm in a nice mood, and this is the only time I'm going to do this, one of my viewers wrote a book called American Millennial. So if you enjoy horror books, check it out. This is the only time I'm doing a free shout out for a product. So don't get any fucking ideas, Nord VPN. Also, Hunter Hancock's performance as Josh's dad in the pen pal video is genuinely amazing. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. Just the friends part if you don't want to watch the entire five hour video. And I'll hop off Meat Canyon's meat in a sec. But I also like his other podcast, Cream Crew. What do you guys want to talk about for the last 15 minutes of the show? I almost made myself cry in the shower yesterday. I was listening to it while walking home, and I stopped to listen to a funny part, and I started laughing, but I didn't realize I stopped in the middle of a road until some car started honking at me, but I had my hood up so the driver couldn't see my headphones, so I just looked like a fucking crazy person, just laughing in the middle of a road. By the way, my favorite characters are the large oaf, the skinny tall one, and the British racist, in that order. Editor, remember to put an ending in the end. Thank I'm the old norm. I want normal beer. As the years pass, Javid, Javid, who the fuck is Javid? What the 